Welcome to my garage where I fix perfectly good things that aren't even broken. This is just a follow-up on the Super Sleeper Project video that I put out where I'm going to discuss a few things that weren't covered in that pictorial. So we'll start in the trunk area, which some people call the bonnet, and look underneath there first. All normal, except there's a few added extra things for the Subaru conversion. The number one thing you'll notice is it now has a radiator. And where do you get the air for the radiator? Well, on a Super Beetle, it's a little easier because US factory Super Beetles had optional air conditioning. And these are the factory louvers for the optional air conditioning. And if you think the Super Beetle was slow, try putting air conditioning on it, it's really slow. In any case, in my, for me, the air goes in, in through there very nicely. It's all boxed in and there, goes through the radiator, and then down through the back and underneath the car to exit. The other thing people ask is, what is all this business about? And simply, it's the fuel pump for the Subaru engine and how that works is gas goes in here, or in my case, E85, goes into the tank, goes in here, and to here, back to the car, back to here, and then back into there. Okay, now, a little more explanation. So, originally, I had one fuel pump in the gas tank called a Holly Sniper Retrofit In-Tank Pump. It was 340 liters per hour, which was fine for the horsepower I had at the time at about 290. When I upped the horsepower of the engine and went on E85 with 1700 uh, ID injectors, I needed more fuel flow. So I put two fuel pumps in here. That's why there's two, two uh, plugs here. And that worked fine. Uh, the second fuel pump works off a Hobbs switch, which is pressure activated on the intake manifold. So at, I have it set at 14 pounds. So at 14 pounds boost, the second fuel pump kicks in. So that way, both fuel pumps aren't always running all the time, which saves on electricity, heats the gas up less, etc. So that was working fine, except now the car, with its newfound power, had so much acceleration that even with a half tank of gas, the gas would push back to the back of the tank under acceleration, and the fuel pump is saying, dude, where's my fuel? There is no fuel to pump. So what happens, there, with the gas pushed up, no fuel has no fuel to pick up. And here is where we introduce the surge tank. And a surge tank is to combat those problems. So how that works is the surge tank is always full of fuel, no matter how much fuel you have in here, provided you have some fuel in there. And, and the way that works is that there's a fuel pump in here. Now I call it a transfer pump. And it pumps fuel into the surge tank, keeping it full. And then when the surge tank is full, it then returns the line back into the main tank. So it's kind of circular to make sure this is always full. <clears throat> so then there's actually two fuel pumps in here too. And now the second one is operated off the hob switch. So uh, this would be the primary fuel pump. And then this would be the secondary. And you can see the Y right there where they come together they go back to the back of the motor, and then from the motor back into the surge tank, and once the surge tank is full, it pumps back into here. This is just a vent line. Anyway, that system seems to be working pretty well for me now. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is this. Maybe some of you know what that is. It's, it's called an inertia switch. And the reason I have that there is because I no longer run the pumps off the ECU or the pulse width management system, modulation system. And so now when the key is on, the fuel pump is always on, which is fine until you get in a big fiery crash or something, God forbid, and you don't want the fuel pump on. And so the nurse switch has a ball inside there that is perched and with, I think it's about 10 G's, it'll unperch itself and, and sh not have this circuit working anymore. So that shuts off the fuel pump so it's kind of a, just a little safety uh, thing to have in the car in the event of something terrible happening, okay? 
So let's go into the inside of the car. Looking on the inside of the car, there was a few things I wanted to show you. We'll start with the glove box. Want to see that again? Inside the glove box are the obligatory hidden gauges. One is an oil pressure gauge and the other one is a boost pressure gauge. And when you turn them on, they spin around, blink at you, change colors, and generally try to keep you entertained. However, I'm not entertained. What I instead use is these lights, which are called idiot lights and are perfect for people like me. One is the generator light and the other one is the all important Houston, we have a problem light. Moving over to the seat belt light, it's been repurposed to now be a check engine light. And this gauge is the water temperature, which is, but is the only gauge on the outside that is not stock, but is kind of necessary to have when you have a water pumper engine. Up here is a Cobb access port and it monitors approximately 638 different functions on the engine, all of which I use about six. The radio is one of my pride and joys. I bought it on eBay and I reconditioned the outside with chrome model paint and painted the little red dial and made it all nice. Do you want to hear it? You're not going to hear it because it doesn't work. It's probably the only thing I ever bought that was probably working and I made it non-working. I completely gutted it and saved nine ounces in the process. But it looks nice and it looks nice for the period of the car. <clears throat> These all turn around but are connected to nothing. The ashtray is one another thing. I spent two or three hours on the ashtray making sure it's <clears throat> completely functional because you never know, it's never too late to start smoking. Now, the pedals, let's get to the pedals. Oh, <laughs> steering wheel is removable. I thought I would need a removable steering wheel, but it turns out I get in and out of the car without taking the steering wheel out. The pedals, these are the, these are the standard pedals. This is the gas pedal. Oh, better not do that, I'm gonna flood it. And these two pedals, if you don't know what they are and you're a millennial, Google them. Okay, so I did put five point harness race seats and a race uh, belt in it for if I have a race, but I do have also just the lap belts when I'm not racing. And let's, sh let's see what's in the back here. Oh, wait. Oh, I know. I made this seat removable. Being they are PRP seats, they're real lightweight, and they mount with the same lugs as a PRP seat would mount. And I made this contraption that locates the seat, and they sit on these guides, and they go into these pins in the back holes, and then they use these palm screws to tighten on this side. And the whole purpose is so that you can get back to here to see what's in the box. And what's in the box is motor components. Starting with the water to air intercooler, it's, uh, you need to service it like put water in it, or the expansion tank, or its dual purpose being a bleeder tank. So the air, excuse me, the water from the motor goes through the thermostat into this point of the expansion tank, which is the highest point in the water system, and it self bleeds, and then it goes through a tube on this side and back to the front of the car where the radiator is. So that's why you need a removable cover, is to access those parts to the motor. And let me see, last but not least is this button right here. And no, it's not a seat ejection button. It's a badass burnout button. And when you press this and push down the brake, it locks up the front tires and you can smoke the rear tires and get them hot enough to get traction for racing. Okay, that sums up, I think, inside the car. Let's move around to the back. The motor that this came out of was a 2009 WRX Subaru. I believe it made 260 horsepower when it was new. There was a few modifications done to it, starting with the short block. It's now an IAG closed decked short block, which has forged pistons and 4340 rods. The heads are the original D25 heads with half a millimeter oversized valves. 
the exhaust valves are Inconel, it has better springs and titanium retainers. The heads have also been ported by SoCal Porting. The intake manifold is off of a naturally aspirated, about a 2005 uh, Subaru. And the reason we use that for turbos is because they flow really nice and they're inexpensive. This is an oil to air separator oil oil to air separator and it's kind of important on a flat four one of the big changes i made was instead of having the turbo in its natural location back here where the water to air intercooler is i moved it down to here which is called the low mount turbo and the reason we do that is because the exhaust manifold is very short when it hits the turbine and the turbine is the motor of the turbo so you have all the heat and energy from a real short exhaust hitting the turbine and, and spooling up the turbo faster. That's why we do that. Now, <clears throat> one of the downsides to a low mount turbo is that it, doesn't ha it can't gravity feed drain the oil supplied to it to the oil pan. So here is the oil feed line to the turbo. And here's the little catch can I made which the oil drains from the turbo, fills up this catch can. Now it can't drain to the pan because it's too low. It's lower than the pan, or at least as low as the pan. So then you need which is called a scavenge pump, which is this, that sucks the pan out of that little tuna size can and then forces it back down into the main oil pan. And it's a lot of, lot of stuff going on there just to drain a little bit of oil, but if you don't have this in here and you start this up, it'll completely fill up the garage with smoke because the oil seeps out into the, both of the impellers on the, on the turbo and turbine. And so you just absolutely need it. This is a catch can. I have one in the front too. And I thought I was real smart by putting one in the back and one in the front. However, it didn't work. The water simply drains out of here and then it's forced up to the front and then overflows out the front. So you can only have one catch can, I found out. So this is gonna be cut off with a, probably a torch and getting rid of because it's no longer needed. Is this thing on? To see other videos of this car or future projects I have, go to my channel. And thanks for watching.